welcome to the World Martial Arts television show. You're going to have to indulge me a little bit here. This is a gentleman that I used to read about back in the day when I was a callow youth. It's Sensei Steve Rowe, just going to help you here. But <laughs> Steve used to write these wonderful articles in, in magazines where people were still doing stuff like, would a roundhouse kick work outside of a chip shop? And you used to come out with some like just amazing, thought-provoking uh, articles. And I'm just so happy to get you. I know that's a really long-winded intro, but the thing is, Steve, you're not exactly your average martial artist. We're going to start, if you don't mind, right? And it's a cliche of mine, but we are going to start at the beginning, just so that if people don't know who you are, just tell us a little bit about how you got into martial arts, first of all. Uh, my brother was the first person to start. He started in the 60s and um, he trained in those days with uh, Tatsu Suzuki in Wadaru. He trained with uh, Chu King Hung in Tai Chi. Uh, he did a little bit of training with Steve Morris. And uh, so he was training around in the 60s to the 70s. Then he went with George Andrews at the Marble factory in Woolworth Road. Um, I was kind of almost separated from my family um, when I was quite young in my kind of very late teens. So I was always intrigued by karate. I was always intrigued by the, uh, I guess, the Japanese writing as well. So I got involved in, I was in the London Fire Brigade. I left that. I got involved in security. Uh, so I kind of find found, if you like, a, a quite self-defence oriented um, karate club at the time in South London, uh, which at the time the first one I trained at was part of John Alexander's Zen Shinru group. If you wow, if yeah, you Zen. and but uh, we broke away from that quite quickly, and I was training under a guy called Jim Fewins, and. Um, because I worked in security, I wasn't really interested in cats or anything like that. It was just violence and fighting, the usual stuff that we had in those days. Um, I had a lot of injuries. Uh, I had my nose reset a while back and they found five breaks in my nose. I you know, cracked cheekbones, several loads of broken ribs, all the usual injuries that we had in those days. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was that kind of start. But uh, it was really, I think... When David Carradine came on in 1973 in Kung Fu, that was the thing that really attracted me. And I think because I'd grown up in South London, I didn't really go to school much. I didn't pass any exams. I, uh, everyone kind of thought I was just young and violent and ignorant. And in those days, yeah, I was, um, which is kind of how I fell into the security trade, really. But um, when I saw that, I kind of knew that I was a very angry person. I was quite violent. I dealt with everything with my fists. My family had done, my friends did. Yeah, in my first karate club, if you didn't like someone, you just hit them. You know, it was that kind of environment. But I knew that I'd end up in prison if I carried on as I was. When I saw David Carradine and the whole Buddhist thing, I kind of, I knew that's what I needed. There was something inside me that just clicked. So 70 three i think it was i went to find my first tai chi club and started training in tai chi well do you know what it's interesting because as you're saying this right obviously i've been reading about you since the mid 80s yeah so the two mm. things that you came out with first of all is to, for you now to tell me it's a bit like finding out that santa isn't real because for you to turn around and say to me that you left school with no qualifications i've always considered you to be like you know at the very least you know don't know like a BA or something because you say you're so well. I <laughs> know oh, I do mean that. You, yeah, what, what, yeah like, I don't get it. Again, yeah, because yeah, I'm like the thing is I'm coming from I'm coming from a generation where you got to remember, Steve. I read about you before I ever heard your voice. I know this sounds mm. really bizarre, but it was like uh, you you know you 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 build up this mental picture in your head of mm. what the person's going to be like, and then for you to say that now, I'm thinking, oh man. Yes, because I'm I'm a bit of an autodidact. I did well at school, but then I wanted to go and do you know I wanted to go to university. No one in my family went to university, you know. So it's like, who do you think yeah. you are? You're going to go to uni, and now everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to do a degree in ceramics. You know what I mean? I don't know what that's all about, but you you understand what I mean. So to, to find yeah. that out got me. And then just as you were saying it, I meant to say because 
at the top of the show, I wanted to say this. Uh, sending his regards as always to you is uh, like this is how crazy this martial arts world works. My BJJ professor Neil Simpkin, one of your students, oh, Neil. Mm. yeah, Neil, because he trained right, he trained with you for years and years, and um, it was just, it was literally as we as as we were doing it, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. Neil was Neil said, <laughs> make sure you say hello to him, you know. But the the thing that I wanted to ask you about here is. Like I've, to my shame, I've always just saw you as a karate cat, and then I I thought that you actually went into tai chi later, without sounding like the cliche. You know, the guy does karate for years and then gets to fifty and then goes, can't bash people anymore. Maybe there was something wrong with me when I wanted to bash someone. Now I'm in, I'm getting the yin to the yang. But like this is from day one, really, with you that you were into tai chi as well as, as well as karate, yeah. I think it would be fair to say by sort of certainly by 1976, I think I was about the second band in karate at the time um, that I took up Tai Chi because I realized that's what I needed. And I've got to say, I found it really hard, you know, to go from a club where we would just fight all the time to being able to stand out in a garden and do all these really slow movements. It was killing me, but I knew that's what I needed. I knew that's what I lacked. And every time Kung Fu came on the telly and they'd go to the Shaolin Temple, um, there was something inside of me that was going, this is what you need. And going back yeah. to Scott, I mean, I, I didn't do well at school. All my family thought I was an idiot. Everybody thought I was an idiot. I thought I was an idiot um, because that's what I was indoctrinated with. If anyone was going to mess something up, it was going to be Steve. You know, If anyone was going to do something wrong, it was going to be me. Um, I fell in with the, the sort of South London street crowds. And so everything was just violence, really. It was just kind of around you most of the time. And, um, but when I went to my Tai Chi classes, my first Tai Chi instructor was a guy called Simon Wired. And uh, he gave me my first copy of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I'd never read a book up until then. So... Wow. Uh, you know, I, I, I got this book. I was 26, something like that. Um, so I opened this book, and when I started reading it, it just clicked with me. I understood everything in it. Since then, I've given it to loads of people and said, oh, you should read this, and they go, I don't understand it. I have classes here where I interpret Lao Tzu to the people here, but I understood it straight away because wow. it, it, it's just what I needed. And, and sort of just to finish it off fairly quickly, um, a good few years ago now, I took a Mensa test and I was in the top 1%. I think I scored 168 or something. Um, so I was obviously highly intelligent, but my brain works very differently to most other people. Uh, you know, I'd say that um, I'm neurologically diverse. I see everything different to everybody else, which you can probably tell by the stuff that I put up on post. Yeah, but you see, the thing... Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. Steve, you know, every every great teacher I've ever met has been like that. You know, yeah. this is like one one of my like Michelangelo is one of my fate like he's a hero of mine. There's two people in the world I'd love to have met: Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. Yeah, you know, uh, and yeah, I fancy myself as a bit of a Renaissance man. The beauty of getting into my fifties now is I can I can read philosophy and Stoicism and not look like I'm full of shit. You know, because I'm like I'm reading it now and I go, no, I get this now. It's like, you know, I, I use this line all the time. When you're younger, you read Hemingway and you go, yeah, I understand what he means. And then when you get older, you know, for, understand Hemingway. I fucking am Hemingway. You know, that's the point where you go, yeah, I, I, I understand. I, you know, I've, got, I've, got, I've got more years behind me than in front of me. And yeah. the, the thing about the neurodiversity thing is uh, that's nearly every martial artist I've ever met as well. Why the hell mm -hmm. would you 10,000 punches into fresh air? You know, you're hyperextending your elbow. Why? You'll, mm. you'll be a better puncher. Well, hit the pad twice. We'll find out if you're any good. And it's uh, it's very interesting because uh, years ago we'd have seen that as maybe a, not a, not a disability, but it would certainly be something to hold us back. But now, Steve, yeah. when you look when you look at it now, it's going. No, I've got a different way of approaching this. You know, that's the, that's that's the thing about being an educator, mm. right? So, yeah. if you can if you can tell me so. At what point did you start to, as I said, with me, I'm, I've always been a huge fan of your writing. You know, that, that's the thing. Not not just the, you know, 
when you did the Samurai on the Door stuff with Dennis, I really enjoyed that. But some of the early stuff that you did, and mm. uh, I, I'm going to have to like I have to add a bit of a caveat, a caveat out with this one, right? Uh, years ago, do you remember there was that period in, in karate especially where it, I think you were the guy that I actually heard first say this, where you spent more time in a blazer than you did in a gi. I think you were you were giving somebody a hard time about karate politics. And you're like, I see the guy in the blazer all the time, but I haven't seen him in a gi for the last year and a half. And I mm. think it was you who said that. And I've, I've kept all the magazines, so I know it. But at what point did you, uh, for want of a better phrase, want to be seen as more of a mover and a shaker to try and because you, you you did bring a lot of stuff together like the political yeah. side of stuff because at that point it was anybody could go they still can go to a church hall hire it teach right but you try to bring a sort a more formulaic approach to an association so how old were you when you brought that in yeah i i because i was with Toru Takamizawa and um Oh, God, it's a long story, but to try and cut it as briefly as possible, Toru was being, um, a lot of the people around him at the time weren't looking after him. And yeah. he got himself into a lot of trouble, a lot of um, financial trouble. A lot of people around him were getting very rich and he was getting very poor. And uh, so we, it, that was when we had Terra Karate. It was a limited company and he was signing checkbooks and just giving them to people. Um, he didn't really understand money. He, he, he didn't know how to deal with it. I was his private student. So I looked at it and he was about to lose his house. Um, he, he was about to be put in prison at the time for uh, money he owed the tax man and so wow. on. I found him a good lawyer. I found him a good accountant. I sold his house up there, bought him a house down here, opened some clubs for him, um, got him to resign out of terror. And um, uh, we formed the Takamizawa Institute of Karate. And I made sure that all of the money went straight to his letterbox. So people had just sent it directly to him. And um, I'm going to set all that up for him. But he asked me to represent him um, on the governing body. So I got the Takamizawa Institute into the governing body of um, karate at the time and kind of rose up from being uh, on the executive committee and then on the secretary, then to chairman. So I became chairman of the governing body for karate at the time. But the, the, the problem we had, everyone was saying at the time, um, competition is the shop window of karate was the same. Uh, and I was the one who put my hand up and said, absolutely no one comes to my club to learn competition karate. They all come because they've watched a Bruce Lee movie or they've watched David Carradine in Kung Fu. Um, and it was that that I thought to myself, yeah, I've got to at least put the traditional aspects forward. So that was then why um, I started writing for combat and then traditional karate uh, and then eventually martial arts illustrated and, and so on. So the writing really came about, I wanted to offer a completely different viewpoint than the one that was prevalent at the time. I had loads of enemies there at the time because nobody liked, you know, they all had their own niche there, didn't they? The whole tournament thing. Yeah. So they didn't like me. And I think actually when they put me in as chairman, it was to get rid of me, but it didn't work. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, but, so, uh, you know, that, that was kind of how that came about. But after and I tried to structure it, we tried to put together all the coaching programs, um, things that people could use in their normal dojo that was other than competition, uh, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to uh, get referees properly qualified. I wanted fighters to have medical records and lists of what happened to them in tournaments and competition, all that kind of stuff which most of it was very unpopular at the time with that particular group. Um, so I tried to structure it. And then I realized one day, I was lucky really because I had Chris Ryan who was a very good friend of mine. And yeah. uh, so Chris became the secretary uh, and we actually ran the offices out of his dojo in Old Street. Uh, Jeff Thompson, uh, the fighter, was also a very good friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, so Jeff helped out a lot of the time as well. Um, but you kind of realise in the end, you just can't win. It was the wrong environment for me. And I oh, realised yeah. that I was I would function much better outside of politics. And that was where yeah. that kind of came from, I think. 
But but it's funny it's funny you said that, Steve. Because, yeah. so, just, yeah. so the answer is to get in the dojo and train and yeah, talk well, and well, discuss well, you, martial no, it's, arts. It, you know? it's quite it's quite it's quite funny it's quite funny you said that because as you're saying this, it's taking me back a little bit because I remember being around all that and uh, I remember I remember Terra. I remember going to the temple in Birmingham and getting kicked down the stairs, walking in there and then getting put through. Uh, Eddie Daniels had his place across the road by the mm. car park. He had that going on. And I, cause I could never work it out because I've actually, I said this to Neil Simkin a few times. I, I, when the Brazilians first came over, I said to Neil, I said, it's going to be the same. I said, we're going to have another Toru here, mate. And it was like, you know, we're going to have another Anoida Sensei. And he go, what? And he go, yeah, because within about five to 10 years, because it's the British mentality, but we've got what we need now. Now we're going to do this. And it was like, as you were saying, it's funny because it was like, there mm. was a movement at the time. As I said, when you were saying about bringing a different approach to karate, I know you already know this, but trust me, you did because you were the first guy. As I said, I saw you as a very cerebral character anyway. You know what I mean? Just by reading the magazines. And it was like, you mentioned, like I used to always wind up Jeff Thompson in Coventry. Cause I always say there was the black Jeff Thompson and the white Jeff Thompson. And I used to say to Jeff, I said, you've got to remember at the moment, you know, people still think you're going to be there with Pat McKay doing the Pursuit of Excellence book. Mm. And then it was like, then Jeff went this way. But at that time, that was when Jeff Thompson was going, right, we need to be in the Olympics. We've got this all going on. We, But like they're looking at us like a bunch of amateurs. And, it, you know, not to mention any names, but I remember going to like, like the Northern Open where there was big brown paper bags full of money and it was there'd be like this mm. poster with fantastic trophies to be won and people were paying 25 quid in the in the 80s to compete in tournaments to mm. win a trophy that you could get from Timpsons for maybe about 40 quid there'd be 30 people in the category and it was all like and for want of a better word it was like almost like the equivalent of goodfellas because you'd see yeah. there was like crew of lads together and like as you said, it would be very popular because they'd be like, no, 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 they didn't even want to pay tax. I went to a competition <laughs> once, and, it was, and and I was like, why is there no posters up? Yeah, we don't want a tax man mm. to know about this one. And I'm like, there's 1,200 people in the room, mate. Mm. <laughs> Someone's going to find out. If you try and explain that to people about the Wild West, they wouldn't do it. So if you don't mind, Steve, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it a little bit forward. So the the next time that you actually came up on my radar. Uh, following you was, you know, you had you had Sheik on, that was going really well, and then you were moving more to Tai Chi, and then like, and I, I mean this in the nicest possible way. Bizarrely, a load of pictures turn up, and it's like, is this an advert for the Czech tourist board? And then because you were doing some doing some uh, camps, uh, is it Jizerka? Was it you were calling? That's it? right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it came up, and it was like again, I was going bit of a younger I was much younger than I am now and I was looking at it, I was being a bit of a mug like because I was like what and then I'm looking at it I'm going no that's exactly what I'd want I don't want to go on a karate course to Bridlington you know where it's like two hours of training then being on the steam for the rest of it you know you know if I'm gonna go I'm gonna go somewhere nice in this tranquil environment and as you're saying it it's like the old you know the David, Car David Carradine thing and I'm like wait a minute Czechoslovakia Tai Chi martial arts Who'd put that together? And then you see it and you go, it is pretty zen, man. You know, because the pictures were lovely. So how did you get mm. yourself over there? It was a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, I had to form my association, Shikon, because myself and Toru have always been good friends, but the people that were around him didn't like me. So for him to keep those, I, I had to leave, if you like. So yeah. I, I, I formed Shik Shikon at the time. Uh, Akimitsu Fuji was my Iido instructor and he gave us the name, he named the association, he drew the calligraphy and so on. Um, and we formed, because uh, uh, Jeff Thompson there as well and Ian Cuthbert was the squad coach as well. Yeah. So um, we had an invitation. They just had the revolution in the Czech Republic. The Berlin Wall had recently come down and we got an invitation go to go to the Czech Open their first international tournament. Uh, so um, I went along with the team, with the squad at the time, and I met um, Andran Musil there, who was the guy who arranged it. He was one of the few people at the time that spoke our language and so on. Uh, so he said to me, uh, will you come over and do a seminar? So I said, yeah, okay. 
what I didn't realise when he said come over and do a seminar was that I was going to be teaching the president's bodyguards, the their police, their special forces, um, and that he was at the time he was the police self defence instructor. So they'd been training in karate with Ochi in Germany. Um, so when we got halfway through the course and they came up to me and said, what you do is far more effective. I'm bearing in mind, I've been working in the security trade and so on. So your self-defense stuff is far more effective than anything that we've learned anywhere else. Will you become the chief instructor um, and, and come over on a regular base and teach the police and president's bodyguards and so on? So that's how the relationship started. And 33, four years later, I'm still going over there. And uh, so we had the summer camps up in the mountains. Now, I who is my representative over there. Um, he was also the squad coach for the Czech team um, for all of those years. And um, his son and daughter have grown up with me around them as well. And um, Robert, his son, is, was world champion. And uh, so you know, we've established quite a, a strong relationship and a very powerful group over there. And actually, it was the Czech government that awarded me my ninth then for wow. services rendered. Yeah, because I took um, I took the Aikido instructors over there. Uh, and of course, in Aikido now, they use um, Joe Tambu, Robert. I forgot his other name. <laughs> it's terrible, isn't it? But um and I took over the Iaido instructors. I took Big Cook over there. So Iaido, Aikido, Tai Chi, Karate all came via me. So Robert Mustard, thank you, Will. <laughs> this is all what you put up there. <laughs> I should oh. Rob, Robert would kill me for that, but um, yeah. So uh, you know, we've, 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 we all of the martial arts over there were kind of established through me. So. Czech national television, every time I go over, well, they would do in interviews and, and come and show the summer camp and so on. And so I actually became quite well well, well known over there. I mean, but I was teaching, I taught in Norway for 16 years, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Portugal, uh, loads of different places. Well, yeah, you know, this is the thing, right? Uh, when it first came up, the only, it was... My, my my instructor, you might remember him, a guy called Andy Margaret. He used to be, he was from Coventry. He was a really, right, he's a lovely bloke. Still see him to this day. He's a great old boy. And he went over to Czechoslovakia with, you might remember, do you remember Jim O'Brien, the Irish guy? He was, no. he, uh, oh, he, well, what, uh, we were talking about Goombas and I was one of his uh, pallbearers at his funeral. And he was a lovely bloke. And he got him somehow, when the Iron Curtain was still down, he managed to get a British select team to go over and fight in Czechoslovakia. But like, mm. it, like he came back and told me these stories about it. And I was like, but, and it just sounded like mad, you know, like secret police coming in, raiding bars and all yeah. of that. All of that. And then obviously when I moved to Germany, it's like, I thought that was all nonsense until I realised that nearly everybody I worked with used to be on the payroll of the Stasi. And I was like, yeah, mm. that's real stuff, you know? But it was when it came up, and I was like, Czechoslovakia, and I'm thinking to myself, this doesn't look anything like what these cov lads are telling me. Like, <laughs> this looks like it, it looks beautiful. But you just said something, and um, where you're on about the shop window of karate and what people thought about it at the time. It was one of the things that always stood out with me. It was like everyone else was talking about how they were going to be movers and shakers, and we're going to get this because at that time it was, we're bringing it to the next level. We need to do. You know, we've got all these people doing it. And I'm not booting you up, but Steve, you were literally one of the only people I saw that used to actually travel the world, getting paid to teach the art, you know, yeah. in, in, in that in that era, because no one else was doing it. Was there a language barrier problem? Or... Yeah. Did, yeah, so how did you get around that? Uh, luckily, Andra um, spoke English really well. So yeah. he did all the tra tra translations for me. I just had to learn to speak clearly, not to use Cockney, um, and speak in words that I knew were translatable. So what 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 drew you to something which was the biggest martial art in the world? Well, still is really, I think, karate. To go into the, I don't want to say esoteric, but the, the more niche areas of martial art. What, the thing what that obviously, as a, 
as I said, the thing that drew me to Tai Chi was uh, David Carradine, the Shaolin Temple, and so on. And I knew that Tai Chi was opposite to everything that I was doing, or I thought it was at the time. I wouldn't say that now. Um, the the Iaido, I think, yeah, it's a Zen art, and it was a traditional Japanese. Although I was training with Toru Takamizawa, uh, Toru was a university graduate. He... Um, he came from a samurai family, um, but he'd gone to kind of university and then as a youngster came straight over here. Okamitsu Fuji had trained in um, Kendo and Iaido since he was five years old, just after the Second World War on the streets in Japan. He trained at the Miyamoto Musashi Shrine Dojo. Uh, he had such an excellent Budo background um, that, you know, another thing to understand is that I've always taken private lessons with all my instructors. So nearly all my instruction has been private. And so I'd go and uh, get um, Fuji out of bed every Tuesday morning because um, he'd like to drink at night. Uh, and I'd drag him down to the Irishman's club uh, across the road from his house and he'd give me a private lesson there. Um, and I think um, he didn't know how much he knew and it took me to draw a lot out of him. So you know, I'd ask a million questions, uh, but particularly about Japanese culture, Budo, the translations of words and so on. Um, so I got so much from Fuji that I could never have got even from any other Japanese instructor. Uh, he was an absolute wealth of in information and, and a great guy and a very good friend. I used to go around his house for dinner and, and everything. You know? I, I was always interested in Japan. But it's only when you go there or you meet a true Japanese person that you realize, you go, we are so different. And the bits mm. that I really admire, I really, really admire. Because as you were saying, I get him up in the morning, he's got, yeah, he's had a few beers the night before, I take him to an Irish bar. And I'm thinking there's, there's a punchline coming here in a minute. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, but most of my Japanese friends are exactly the same. You know, you yeah. go to it and then when, when it's time to drink, it's time to drink. When it's time to work, it's time to work. But it was the, 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 just as you were saying it, I'm thinking, isn't this really strange? Because normally the student teacher dynamic, there's the, the hierarchy going on. But when you, when you, you, you've got that in a one to one, but I don't know if you, you might agree with me on this. I always think that when you do the, when you do a one to one, it's more of an elective hierarchy. It's not like going into a class. And jumping in there, another 30 guys in, and you're like, oh man, I'm just jumping in with these guys. Yeah, I'm just another sheep. Yeah. Whereas, I think you elect it's, it's, a, it's, it's the way you learn. You know, I learn much better by asking questions. You know, yeah. so like you have 100 questions in my mind. So uh, for 15 years, I went to Birmingham every single week from Kent <clears throat> to train the Toru uh, and eventually moved him down to me. But we yeah. we became friends. Toru was a, a, a very odd character, but we got on extremely well. And um, by asking questions and talking, I could learn so much more from him. Fuji was like a 13th century samurai warrior born out of his age, you know. Um, he, he, he literally was that kind of way. But, um, but he knew so much about Budo that even when I'd be doing a seminar with Toru, Toru would draw something in Japanese on a board and he'd say something like Metzger. And then he'd see me standing there and he'd go, Steve, what do you know about Metzger? Because he knows I would have learned yeah. from Fuji. Uh, and um, so yeah, my understanding of Japanese words, of Budo, of Japanese culture and so on, I got a lot from them. The funny thing is that um, the Japanese are... Um, very strange in the sense that, I mean, certainly Toru and Fuji were no good with money. They never wanted to talk about money. Uh, I used to just put stuff in a red envelope and put it in their bag. and We never discussed the money at all. Um, I used to sort it out for them with Fuji. He'd run out of money. I had to pay to bring his instructors over. I helped him by buying a load of his books and selling them for him. I wrote two books with Toru Takamizawa. Um, had them printed and sold them to get him money as well. You know, so they were both absolutely useless with cash, with money, um, but you know, they, they, they were well worth training with, well worth learning, well worth putting myself out for them. Uh, when I went to, to Hong Kong, um, 
Chinese are, are the opposite. So Chinese are all money and everything's money and they tend to not treat you very well. And uh, you've got to put the money in a red envelope. It's got to be brand new notes, unmarked, straight from the bank, um, exorbitant money normally. And you would give it to them with both hands in the red envelope. They'd take it, the cash out of the envelope and count it in front of you. Yeah. You know, so uh, everything, so the difference between the Japanese and the Chinese, in my experience, uh, really was quite profound. Uh, and in and in Hong Kong, everything was just about money, everything. Yeah, but you see this, yeah, but you see this thing, you know, and I, I know that's like we could go down the right geopolitical route where two worlds collide and all of that, and then the British mm. influence and like the, the fighting over it because it was such a hub. But when you were saying it about Fuji, especially, it's like, you know, I've got a few friends who are a bit like that and they're bad with money. Don't get, but what it is is it not, it's not like they're tri- that they're not frivolous with money. They just no. see money. They see money as a trifle. When I look at them, it's like, and I don't mean trifle to drink, you know, uh, to eat. You know, like it's just like, why would I be interested in it? I've got bigger it, yeah. things to worry about than a piece yeah. of paper with the king or the queen's head on it. And it, mm-hmm. it, it, it was like you were saying. The minute you said he was a man out of his time, I'm like, yeah, I know a few guys like that where it's like mm. they don't. They, 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 I'm not. I'm not going to get involved with these ludicrous ideas. You know, it's, you'll know this as we're mm-hmm. as we're all getting older, Steve. You know now, like you couldn't pay me to watch TikTok. You couldn't no. pay me. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I like. I like. I like Facebook because I like to be argumentative and I like to question mm-hmm. people. But that's just like an old guy. Like, like, yeah, I'm a bit like Don Quixote. You know what I mean? Tilting at windmills and arguing with people that aren't even really there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's. As you get older, you realise that... The thing is, that, got the thing is though, mate, I'm the same. I, I, I've never... I mean, the one thing that I've always understood is you, you need to pay your bills. Live humbly, you know? So I've never lived exorbitantly. I've got a small flat over the top of my dojo that I live in. I drive just a normal, you know, type car. Um, I don't... I've never been on holiday hardly at all, ever. Um, I'm vegan. I don't smoke. I don't drink. So uh, with I paid off my mortgage 15, 20 years ago on both the dojo and my flat. Uh, so I don't owe any money, but I have always lived very humbly. And what I do, uh, I don't talk about money. I put money up front with students. They only ever pay me by direct debit. So we sort out the money right at the start, and then we just never talk about it again. Uh, and that way, I think it, that that works. Well, it's funny you said that because it was one of the when when I was looking at getting a full time academy. Neil Simpkin was <clears> like, <throat> so Neil speaks so highly of you. You know, he like I, if you don't mind me asking, just as, as me being like nosy, how many years did Neil travel down to to you from Birmingham to train? A lot. I can't remember how many. But <laughs> yeah. I saw the club was, down in Swanley. It was a kid when he first came down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, yeah. again, it's, uh, you know, another another man who was born out of his time. But it was like Neil said to me, he goes, only person I know who's really smart when it comes to teaching martial arts goes Steve Rowe. And I went, really? He goes, yeah, he lives above his dojo. He goes, mm-hmm. he doesn't have two mortgages. He goes, and you go, he's got, this, he's got the fastest commute in the world ever. You know what I mean? He goes downstairs. Uh, now, this is going to lead me on to where, how I actually got to meet you. I met you through that scoundrel and that rascal pillage, right? And mm. I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask you because I, I'm going to quickly preface it with this. I met pillage because he rang me up to see if I'd teach some Thai boxing for him. I went down there, spoke to him. Within about 15 minutes, I, 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 I liked him. Within 20 minutes, I had to turn around and say, listen, me and you were going to get on really well. But if you can just knock off all of that BS that you're coming mm. out with right now, keep it for the marks we'll pay. Right for the guys who really wanted that, because I always used to say about pillage, he should have been a carnival barker. Yeah, because again, Steve, <laughs> the thing is, me and you know a pre, we know a pre, cancer mm. Tony Pillage, and when like he's one of the only people I know that as a person became a much better person by being tested by cancer. Yeah, because yeah. I know loads of guys go, oh, he's great, he's great, and I went, you never met him when I met him, and they were like, what? And I said, within twenty minutes, I had to say to him, Tony. Me and you will be friends for life. For, mm-hmm. And there's two things. First of all, we'll never, ever be in business together. And secondly, knock off some of that 
crazy shizzle that you're coming out with. Because it, yeah, if it worked, guess what? They'd be doing it in the UFC, or they'd be doing it. Yeah, they'd be doing it. The SWAT guys would be doing it. So, how did you meet him? I know Tony from his GKR days. No way! When he was a green belt and told everyone, you know, that, he, I don't know how he, he got he, away with that. It kind of got out of that, and he wanted to meet Chris Rowing uh, because he'd had yes. a lesson with Chris Rowing. That's so he phoned me up. Um, so I probably know him longer than almost anybody else in the martial arts. Yeah, and uh, and we kind of became friends. And I liked him because he was a large character. I suppose you, in a way, you could say there was pre Jesus Tony and post Jesus Tony. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Before he kind of became the prophet as such, but. But um, he's always been a good friend. And he, um, when I had both of my knees replaced and I was in a wheelchair, he'd drive all the way down from Coventry, pick me up, he bought us some tickets for the Who concert and took me to the Who concert, pushing me around in the wheelchair, which he absolutely loved, dancing next to me in the wheelchair. Uh, we went yeah. to see the Dalai Lama together. We we went to Scotland um, together for seminars. Um, uh, we went to tattoo conventions, and so it was just we, we, were, we were friends. And um, and Tony, yeah. I, I probably did the same to you. Tony would phone me up every day from the bath. You always hear him yeah. gurgling in the bath. He'd ring you up, and and he'd just ring you up to talk. But only friends do that. Yeah, well, um, you see, it's funny you say this because just as you were saying this. Like uh, uh you know, with with I I I always liked him, always right. And the first time I ever met him, he had got uh, Chuck Liddell over to do a seminar at the Body Power, and he didn't even have any focus mitts, so he was charging all these people money. Saw me, recognised me, and he says, "Oh, come on in, jump on in." I was like, "Yeah," and then. Then he was like, oh, uh, you know, it's 15 quid. And I went, oh, no, I'll let it go, mate. And he was like, oh, well, in that case, come on in. But the thing is with Pillage, i got to quickly tell you two stories. First one, this was when he was riddled, riddled with cancer, right? We went to see Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, the musical, and he'd managed to somehow purloin his ticket somehow, right? And we went to see it at the theatre in Birmingham, and I went to the toilet, and as I went to the toilet, I, I left him there and he was in pretty rough shape at this stage. And I came back and it was a matinee show. I should have mentioned that at the start. So it was all Darby and Joan characters who were all that. And I come back and there's these old women tut tutting away at me. And I'm like, you're right, Tony, you want, you want an ice cream? And he's like, oh, and he was like really like milking it. Oh, and I said to him, I, yeah, and because he, he looked bad, he, yeah, you believe him. He goes, oh, no, no. And then this woman said, you should be ashamed of yourself. And I went, what? What are you on about? And she went, you should be ashamed of yourself. You and him have been married for the last 15 years and you're embarrassed to be out with him. And the thing was, I was like this going immediately. I'm like, Tony, please say that you've got stage four cancer. Don't say you've got AIDS because that's going to make it look even worse. And then he goes, oh yeah, told him I had AIDS. And you're like, oh God. So that was it. I went back, told my wife, she couldn't believe that. And my wife actually liked Tony because she used to say, I don't really like many people in martial arts because they're dead weird, but I actually like Tony because he's like weird and then another level of weirdness. And then the second time we went to see um, Wilco Johnson and we go, and at th this stage, Tony is done. He is like that. Yeah. We, we were there and he, he was already talking about, he didn't have long to live, long to live. And uh, I ended up, I had to like, Tony is really funny. Because Tony was telling everyone that he foot swept two people because guys were bumping into him and we were in this roped off area and we'd already mm. been in, spent two hours with Wilco, had a great crack. And um, that, that was an experience all its own. And this guy bumped in and I said, look, leave it out, mate. The guy's got cancer. And this guy says, you what? Yes, yeah, screw it. So I was like, what? So I spun him around, put him in a rear naked choke, dragged him out, mm. came <laughs> back and Pillage was tripping people over because they were starting trouble. And he was like, putting his foot out, tripping them over. And then he told everyone that he they were foot sweeps. And I was like, no, no, you've just tripped them up. And he was, <laughs> and the thing was, he was tripping them up quicker than I could drag them out. Because as soon mm. as he hit the deck, I had to pull them out. But it's like you were saying, the thing is with Pillage, he was a polarizing character, but all of the fun stuff I had with him had nothing to do with martial arts. You know, That's it was right, just yeah. pretend, pretending to be his life partner. You know what I mean? Mm. Or, you know... Uh, yeah, at a Wilco Johnson concert. So uh, I hope you don't mind. That was a pretty, 
sort of ham-fisted way for me to get into <laughs> what you're going through yeah, now. I actually, but, I actually took him. I actually took him to check on the summer course. He, he asked to come, and I put right. him in a room with one of my third dans, and I said to the third dan, "Tony's a lazy bastard." So um, make sure he comes out doing the seven o'clock in the morning training sessions, get him up, get him out. And, uh, and my friend did. He, and if you'd seen Tony get dragged out every morning to do his training, <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely hilarious. We're, we're, we had some really funny times there. But yeah, he, he was, he, I, I liked Tony. He was, he was a good friend. And I've got the biggest respect for Sarah. I think, you know, Sarah stuck by him through thick and thin. Yeah, yeah, and, she did. Uh, yeah, yeah, because... Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say he was the easiest guy to live with. You know what I mean? No, because he was amusing, amusing mm -hmm. character. But that's it. Yeah. So that's gonna. But because the last time I saw you was at Tony's funeral, and I don't know how well your health was then. It was but it was because yeah. I had to take a second. I had to take a second look at you. I don't know if you remember because I had to take mm -hmm. a second look. And that, that this is a bit where, um, when you do a podcast, the great thing about doing podcasts is Steve that I get to ask questions that in polite conversation, mm -hmm. I couldn't ask for myself, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. I say, well, the people who are watching this would be interested and stuff. But yeah, I've been following you on, yeah, because again, there's pluses and minuses to social media. If it's nonsense, I can't live with it. But what you've been going through and you've documented it and you've been really real about it, you know, first of all, nothing short of inspiring first of all and I, and I do mean that that's not bs either mm -hmm. but if you don't mind me asking how has your training helped you and you know going from this vital like robust individual to having everything tested you know, can me, you explain what let you've me, done let me try and put it in a nutshell um because yeah. it, otherwise it'd be too too long a story i've had 25 surgeries um I've had three life-threatening sepsis infections. And one of the worst ones was in 2015 when I collapsed coming back from Czech Republic, uh, was rushed. Uh, it took them an hour to get me into the ambulance because I was having um, a heart attack and everything at the same time. It was, But it was a really bad sepsis infection. And after a couple of surgeries there, um, I knew they were, they were actually killing me and they were trying to prep me for a third surgery. So I managed to get um, a booking for um, a private surgeon up here, uh, but I couldn't get an ambulance to transport me because it had to be with all the tubes in. I couldn't even get a private ambulance to support me. In the end, I had to discharge myself, ripped all the tubes out, phoned Will Henshaw. Thank you, Will. And Will came up and got me and took me up. And, and the Will, I tell you, I was at death's door at the time. Uh, and um, I was in the private hospital for five months. They took my knee away. They put an antibiotic spacer in. Eventually, they fused my leg straight. But my third sepsis infection was um, when they had to amputate my leg. The bar that was going through my leg had come up through the bone. My leg was awful. It was huge. So they rushed me in. They blue lighted me in then, and they amputated my leg. I, that was in 2021. Uh, and um, I... I Came out from that, been through the rehab. I was just having the final kind of um, <clears throat> blood tests for infection when they found cancer. And that was when, therefore, I then had to go through the whole prostate cancer thing. I don't have to talk that much about that because you had Gavin on last time. And Gavin, yeah. I think, explained it, it explained it all extremely well. Yeah. But leading on from that, um, I can talk about what it's done for me. But um, there was four of us, four senior martial artists. We all... We all had the same Gleason score for cancer. That was myself, Gavin Mulholland, Paul Coleman, and Tony Childs. And so we formed a little message group in Messenger where we would talk to each other. And of course, unfortunately, Tony died. He had his prostate removed and had a blood clot, so he died. Um, but that was why I decided to do the seminars for Gavin Mulholland and Paul Coleman which you've probably yeah. seen up on Facebook. They were all yes. fully booked within days. Um, I've got 60 people on each course. <clears throat> so really looking for, I'm, I'm amazed that anyone wants to learn from a one-legged 72-year-old um, guy falling to pieces. But, you know, they were fully booked. So that's brilliant. And I'm really looking forward to those. Going back to the 2015 one, when I, everybody thought I was dying then. And um, 
I did, well, I was in hospital, I did 52 days of meditation. And at the end of each meditation, I wrote a poem. And that's the book that I published was, was going to be my um, legacy as such, because I thought I was dying. So each poem I wrote down, I published a book on my iPhone in hospital <laughs> through um, Amazon, uh, through wow. um, Lulu and onto Amazon. I did it all on my phone. And um, I thought that was going to be the end. But uh, anyway, I survived. And um, Gavin King said to me at the time, um, why don't you do a coaching program for Tai Chi? Which uh, made me set up the coaching programs that I started to run. And the thing there was that um, I set those up. The first one was in 2018. Uh, and I've done one every year since. That's five years I've been running these coaching programs. And the great thing about those coaching programs is that they're all other martial artists, all senior martial artists. So I've put through now about somewhere between 80 and 100 people that are in the martial arts, most of them already, fifth, sixth hands in karate, uh, Wing Chun, Kung Fu, uh, all the different martial arts. Uh, if you don't mind me saying, Jeet Kune, Do, Jeet Kune Do and Carly, I'll be remiss of me not to mention Aaron Davis, one of my teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that was a surprise because Aaron popped up and I was like, I didn't even know you knew Steve. I didn't know you were interested <laughs> in Tai Chi. He goes, more to me than meets the Iceman. But yeah, it's yeah. so tell, tell me, sorry to interrupt, but so, I had to get Aaron so, in there. So my point is that, that what I've been able to do, I think one of the things that I'm very good at is structuring. So you know, when it comes to coaching, I'm very good at putting together putting together a structure of learning. Uh, and it's the way to simplify without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You, you need the depth, but I use a whole kind of process of like keywords and so on um, that that we work through. But it's I don't think there is any different. In the end, there's no difference whether it's Tai Chi, Karate, Jeet Kune Do, whatever it is. Everyone's got an inside and an outside. You know, so when you talk about internal and external, I mean, originally internal and external simply meant whether it was inside the Shaolin Temple or outside, but it gradually became to mean the difference between sort of soft and hard. But actually, um, through the Tai Chi, I teach the internal that you can apply to all of the other martial arts. So it's improved people's, you know, Kali, Karate, Kung Fu, Wing Chun. Everyone said it's made such a difference. So learning the, the kind of how to use your spine, your core, uh, to manipulate it, to get um, internal power, what chi actually, other than Gavin saying last time, you know, about so, you know, there is something to chi. Of course, there's cheese. Everything is actually perfectly explainable. It's scientific. It's biological. It's not that difficult to understand. Um, it's just that people tend to put a kind of salesman's haze over it all. But I can explain it. And um, the great thing there is I've been able to put it into all of their martial arts. So Tai Chi's become a lovely kind of core art that they can still do whatever it was they was doing, but they can add something to it on the inside. And that's been really well, helpful and useful. Well, you see, the thing is, Steve, as you, as you were saying this, you know, without sounding too esoteric, it brings me right back to the beginning when you were saying you were there and you were doing karate first, boom, boom, boom. And then to go and slow everything down, be in the back garden, doing these movements. And like, it, it's funny, I was just at jiu-jitsu this morning. I was rolling with this guy and he's scrambling around, he's going crazy. And I went, you're really good, man. You're really fast. That's, that's, that's. And I was like, that's some fast shit you're doing there. And he went, oh, thanks, thanks. I went, no, no, it's just shit done really fast, mate. And then he started laughing mm. and I was like, mate, as I've got older, I've realised it's, slow it down yeah my main teacher in the uk terry barnett used to always say mm -hmm. if you slow it down first of all you have to be in the moment all the way through there's no start and stop there just is right and then he said and the other one as well is you know when it's not right and that's mm -hmm. like with, with, with tai chi one of my 2023 one of my um one of one of my things that i'm going to do is i'm going to come down and see you because a uh, good enough for aaron davis good enough for mm -hmm. me right but it's Again, it's that time of your life where I'm going, uh, maybe there's a reason why I can't do it fast anymore. Maybe maybe I'm being told. Uh, My yeah, body's saying I, to me, no, no. I'm quite aware of how our time runs out very quickly. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, something that I just love to 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 add in. Someone said to me, if you could pick any instructor, living or dead, to train under, who would you pick? And I said, me. And they said, well, that's a bit arrogant, isn't it? And I said, no, because I I became the instructor that I always wanted. I was always looking for me, but I never found me. You know, so I went to lots of different places, lots of different instructors, and I got little bits and pieces. And I've got to say, a lot of my knowledge came from outside of martial arts because I studied Buddhism for 50 years. I studied mindfulness. I studied meditation. Um, you know, these are the keys to everything I teach. Mindfulness, which is what you was just saying, really. Mindfulness, the art of paying attention, is really the most important thing. And sort of harking back to the thing that you nearly touched earlier, um, how did my training help me when I went through all these really bad times? It was mindfulness and meditation because I was able to observe objectively what I was going through subjectively. I could, I could observe my pain. I could observe my suffering. I could observe my anxiety, my angst, my, my fear. I could observe it objectively because of my mindfulness, because of my meditation. And that, without a doubt, Buddhism saved my life. You, you see, it, again, look, I, I've been, no, I, I'm a lapsed Irish Catholic, right? And I've tried, I was always tell people, I always try and walk the eightfold path. Not always works for me, but at least I'm aware of it. You know what I mean? And it's that mm. whole thing that, yeah, you're only truly ignorant when you don't realise how ignorant you are, you know? And it's, as you were saying about the, it's almost, I remember I've only ever had it a couple of times in martial arts where it's felt like an out-of-body experience where I'm on the outside looking at me, but knowing I'm still on the inside. And I don't want to sound like a really awful Joe Rogan and say it was DMT or anything. It wasn't. It was a moment of, for want of a better word, pure clarity and nirvana where I was there and I was like, man, you know, you know it's like the end of Highlander, you know, where you go, I am everything, I know everything. Mm. And, like, and you don't have to chop off people's heads to get that nirvana in martial arts, you know what I mean? But it was um, the Buddhism thing, 50 years studying Buddhism, right? So my mathematics tells me that a 22-year-old lad from South South London, I, I don't know, man, how did you get into Buddhism? Well, again, it comes back to when Kung Fu first came on the telly, was at that time. So the whole um, David Carradine thing was the thing that attracted me to it. And, and like I said, I think I always had this deep thing that I was interested in Oriental philosophy and intrigued because even Japanese writing, as I said earlier, the calligraphy, the fact that you draw pictures instead of words appeared to, appealed to my way of thinking because it presents a whole thing. And um, so the whole thing with the Buddhist monasteries and the Buddhism and so on, that really intrigued me. And I was very lucky in that I started to study Theravadan Buddhism. And um, I was going to the Chithurst Monastery. Do you remember Nathan Johnson? He wrote loads of books on martial arts. Um, he wrote uh, yeah. Barefoot Zen, Zen Shorin Do Karate. Yes, yes, um, yes, he, yes. He, he was a Wing Chun guy down in Southampton. Um, but I used to train with him a lot. He, again, he was quite a good friend as well. And he introduced me to Chithurst Monastery. He took me down there and I got one of the Asians to come over to my summer course in, I think, Brighton to give lectures. Um, and then I started buying every lecture tape from Amravati Monastery and listening to those and uh, all, all the books that they supply from there. I started reading all those. So uh, that was how I got into it. And it's something that I could relate to. I think the thing that I could relate to most was because I can simplify things. I can bring things down to their, their ethos and their principal ideas that, that kind of pervade everything. Same with any martial art idea or principle. And that's exactly what Buddhism does. And the Buddha, I think when he became enlightened, he, he, he didn't just teach princes and uh, people from the higher castes in India. He, he had to teach people that couldn't read or write. And I think he, he was really clever because he must have looked at it and thought the one thing that everybody's got in common is that we all suffer. 
So yeah. if you can understand suffering and an enlightenment from the suffering, so his four noble truths, people pass them by very quickly. Oh, yeah, you know, there is suffering. There's a cause of suffering, blah, 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 eightfold path. But they don't realize how deep all of those uh, four noble truths actually go. You know, they are the essence of Buddhism, but they pervade absolutely everything. Well, it's funny, it's funny you're saying this, because as you're just saying, like, uh, th this is why I love doing this. Because, you, you know, it's just as you're having a conversation, it's almost like organic. It's like you were saying, uh, there's two things. First of all, really dear friend of mine, John Will, if you haven't met him, I'd love you to meet him. Uh, he's in my top three teachers of all time. And his whole thing is there's two types of way, two types of things you've got to realize. Because first of all, you need to, everyone wants to understand stuff and have a broad understanding. He said, but you need to have the deep understanding as well. And he's a great man when it comes to, like, again, he'll he'll say he's neurodivergent as well. And he'll turn around and he'll say, he goes, if you can boil it down to its essence, he goes, there's these inevitable truths in everything. So when you, you, when you were just talking there about suffering, it's like, yeah, I've had a little bit of this in my life where, you know, I was dead lucky. I got to 48 before anyone that I was close to passed away, right? And up until that point, I was like, I always knew in the back of my head that, you know, I, I would fold because, you know, you, you'll know this, Steve, right, especially what you've gone through. It's that easy to be tough when you've never been tested. You know mm. what I mean? It's, yeah, it's like that. It's like, yeah, I'm double tough. And you go, yeah, you haven't been tested yet, son. The minute mm. you've been tested, you'll find out, right? And one of the things that got me was my father passed away. And I'm Irish and Catholic. We had a, a dodgy relationship at the, at the start because I, I lived in 16 years of abject terror of him, right? And then obviously it was only when I, my son was born and I looked at my son and I went, at one point, my dad had to look at me like this. So that like, he didn't change. I changed. Right. But then when he passed away, mm. it got me. And what got me through that was the five stages of grief, which sad, as mm. you were saying, people walk past it immediately. And it's only when you're in there, you go, no, no, I ha it has to be. If I want acceptance, I have to go through everything first. I have to go through anger, have to go through denial, have to do everything. And it was like, just as you were saying it, it's like, it makes me think about everything that when it comes to martial arts, but then that's everything yeah. in life. You know, if yeah, you yeah, haven't yeah. got, if you haven't got that core principle straight, you know, you, you'll know this, like the most disappointing thing you'll ever find, especially in the martial arts world is when you meet people who are just amazingly good physically. And then mm. you spend five minutes conversation with them and you go, man, you're like the biggest douchebag I've ever met in my life. How the, and, you, and sorry, don't want to get demonetized there, but you know, a bit where you go, how the fuck have you got this far and not picked up any of that? And then, and again, this shows me, this is how unenlightened I am. I'm like, dude, I've suffered for this art and I don't get to do the arm bar like you do, mate. You know what I mean? That's the, <laughs> that's the whole thing. But again, that shows it. So yeah, I'm, I'm 54 next month, but I still believe in my head that I'm only about 28, maybe 29. Mm -hmm. But so with the Buddhism, right? You've done, you don't mind it, and this is totally indulging me. Uh, yeah, as I said, when I saw you at Pillage's funeral, I had to do a double take, and it was it was really funny because like, we'd met before, met a couple of times, and you were always super gracious with me, yeah, and I really mean that. And then I saw you, but it was the first time I saw you, and it was. Believe it or not, you're probably one of the first people I ever met that I looked at you and I knew it was you, but you didn't look like the you that was in my brain. Does that make sense? Mm, mm, because yeah. you weren't going, you weren't, you weren't looking good at the time, right? And then as you were talking about the surgeries, you'd only put on Facebook there only a couple of days ago, you'd mentioned it. And then I remember the picture of your leg. And I remember seeing that. And I was at jujitsu with Neil Simpkin. And I said to Neil, I've said, Have you, are you following Steve? Have you seen this? Showed it, right? And the, this whole big thing is coming to the point of, um, yeah, having a leg amputated is a huge thing, right? And for a person like yourself who has this, uh, and I'm not bittering you up, but it's just who you are, right? For a person who has such a massive understanding of who you are as a person on an intrinsic level, mind, body, spirit, the whole lot, and I'm being indulgent here for me because I just want to know your thought process. What's it like having that removed? Um, 
I think at, at the time I was in such a bad state of sepsis that I, I'd accepted it, it had to come off and that I'd have to deal with whatever it was afterwards. I, I, I really wouldn't want to go through it. It's horrible. It's nasty. It, it's dirty. The, 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 the drains, the scars and all that. Think of what Gavin was talking about. It's in a similar vein. Um, yeah. And I'm still recovering from it now, and I still find it hard to accept now. So acceptance is something I, I counsel a lot of people privately, not for money, but they just message me all the time, people. Uh, and there's a couple of people at the moment going through a really hard time uh, and you know, saying that they're angry and they can't accept these things. And my answer to them is that, you have to understand acceptance. You know, you can't hang on to a thought. It's impossible. Thoughts just come and go. But what happens is you keep hurting yourself. You keep you keep reproducing that thought again and again and again. But actually, when you're angry, you become that anger. And that's why you've got to be able to separate yourself from it, to be able to look at it and examine it. But you have to let it in. Don't try and push it away. You have to let it in. And then you've got to look at it, examine it. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this angry? Why do I feel so anxious? Why do I feel, you know, why, why have I got these feelings? But you can look at it objectively and you're, you're observing the feeling rather than being that feeling. But you have to let it in. You've got to examine it. You've got to go through that process. And it takes as long as it takes. And there's a saying, keep both doors open because mm. thoughts come and go. You know, so it'll come in. You're, you're going to have to deal with it and then it'll go. And, you know, this story, I've, I've put it up fairly recently about the Buddha and the two arrows. You know, the, the, the Buddha said there are two arrows of suffering. The first one is the, the suffering in life that you can do nothing about. You know, all the time you're in this meat carcass, you're going to have suffering. It's, it, it's why you're here. You know, so um, you've got suffering you can't avoid. But then the second arrow is the suffering you can avoid, and that is don't suffer about your suffering. Don't be angry about your anger. You know, don't be sad about your sadness. So you have to let that first level of suffering in and you've got to accept that. Um, I know I'm never going to be the same again. I'm not going to be the Steve Rowe I was before. That's past. That's gone. I have to accept that. I have to accept that I'm flopping around with a stump on one side uh, and, and so on. Um, and you know, there's a million things I'm never going to be able to do again. But that's acceptance. So I, I have to work through that. And once I can accept it, then I can let it go and just be who I am now. But I dealt with a lot of the pain and suffering because when I'd be doing my Tai Chi laying down in a hospital bed, I've done it sitting on the side of the hospital bed. I've done it in wheelchairs, chairs. Um, so my, that little bit of Tai Chi and meditation every, and mindfulness every day always played a very important part in keeping me stable. And that mindfulness... You know, the word mindful means you're observing. Mm. You know, you're you're looking at, you're, you're watching your behavior, you're watching your feelings, you're watching your thoughts. So mindfulness is not something you sit down for 20 minutes and and om or whatever it is to be mindful. Yeah. Mindfulness is something that you do all, all the time, all day. I draw a line in my mind, you know, and all the time I'm being mindful, I'm in the pluses. When I'm not mindful, I'm in the minuses. And at the end of each day, I ask myself if I ended up in the pluses or the minuses. Yeah. You know, so mindfulness is something you have to work to maintain. And what I did through all the pain and the agony and the angst and the suffering and the anxiety attacks. And of course, the other thing is, you know, is drugs, you know, drugs that you take for, for pain and so on, they create a lot of anxiety. You, you, even for the, the cancer stuff, the, um, uh, what do they call it? The hormone blocking drugs and that they give you anxiety and so on as well. You know, you could burst into tears and you're looking at it and you're going, why do I, I've never felt like this in my life. Yeah. Why do I feel like this? But at least you can watch it and observe it. So I spent a lot of time saying, this is not who I am. I know yeah, what it, I am. Yeah. You see, it, 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 again, it was like, there's been a couple of times I said, it's Gavin. Um, it was when Garrett Gavin was on about the Tallygate tattoo that he's going to have, and he was on the fifth day and the nineteenth day. And I only re I only re-listened to that yesterday. God, I've listened to it about mm. five times because it's been so profound to me. And it was like those moments where it was like, but I've been been strong. I've been strong. And it's like that classic, you know, where it's the two footprints in the sand, you know, and it's you know, well, that's the point where mm. I carried you. And you look at it and you go, 
yeah, the the reason I'm saying all this is as kids, we're we're never told this. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Your, your parents, your parents will tell you like they lie to you about Santa Claus, and they should tell you the truth. Life's gonna suck. The older you get, it's gonna suck more. You know, if you're yeah. lucky, if you're lucky, guess what? It, it, you're just gonna lose people close to you. But, but that's all part and parcel of life. But that's the lucky part when you're doing the suffering part. And again, it's like. You were saying about the anxiety. I've only ever had anxiety once in my life, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And it was medically related. My left arm went numb, and I was like, oh, shit, man. I'm that guy who's trained all his life, and I'll be like the cautionary tale in Witherspoons to guys drinking beer. And they'll be like, ah, oh, you see that, Mick Tully? Mm -hmm. Trained his whole life. Oh, he should have just drank 20, drank tw like 15 pints a day and smoked 20 fags. Yeah, who's the mug? All of that. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I just don't feel me. You know what I mean? And like exactly. with, with Gavin, with Gavin, when I spoke to him, it was there. And then with you, I don't know if you remember, yet there was a period there just after you'd had the uh, your surgery on your leg, you had the amputation. And it was, and I, I really mean this, like, even though you were suffering through it, that some of the thoughts that you made me deal with, because you, you, I don't know if you remember, you had, you had maybe about a week where you were talking about phantom, the, the it was a the, oh, the, phantom pain, yeah, yeah, and like and like what that did was it was bizarre for me because I'm going like this, like as I said, Steve, I've pretty much read everything you've ever written, mm. right? and I mean that, right? And of course, one of the things that driven drove me to always following your stuff was when everyone else was doing the old, oh look at my round kick and my washer, Gary Karate, this is what it's all about, and then you were coming out with some real Zen level shit, and I was like. That's mm. the sort of stuff I want to listen to. And then when you did it, I was, first of all, I, I've known for years how mentally and physically strong you are. As, stay, uh, as Neil Simpkin always used to say, he goes, <laughs> don't let anyone ever think, like if anyone thinks of Steve Rose, just a bit of Tai Chi, mate. He goes, that guy can kick your ass, mate, for <laughs> real. And he used to say that about you all the time. But when you said about the phantom pain, I was like, this is a really smart guy who knows that the pain isn't there. Because physically it isn't there. So what's going on with his brain chemistry to make him mm. do this? And how do you contact? And as you would, like, I'm not saying that you've totally dealt with it or anything, but the uh, way you were dealing with, you were dealing with that online and I was following mm. it. And if you don't mind, because that's literally something that has fascinated me because mm. how do you get around the, you know, it, the leg's not well, there anymore. So how, and I, how do you do and it? I, I still get it. Right. I still get phantom pain. I still get and quite badly at times as well. But originally they gave me pregabalin, which is a gabapentin type, a modern gabapentin drug to, to help with it, which was actually very helpful. But I, that made me really ill. The pregabalin made me ill. It made me a permanent kind of chest infections. My iron levels dropped down. I became anemic and so on. So in the end, I and it and it took me ages to get off the pregabalin as well, because right. it was a very very ad addictive drug for me. But um, yeah, I still have to deal with that now. But I, let me just say because I think one of the things that that will help everyone is to to just understand this idea of how you deal with pain, how you deal with anxiety, and so on. Um, it's so simple, and everybody tends to complicate it. I'm not simple doesn't mean easy, <laughs> but to understand it is quite simple, right? And when you breathe deeply, your body calms down, right? And to help you to breathe deeply, you need a good posture. So the basic structure is, however you do it, standing, sitting, laying down, whatever, it doesn't matter, but good posture and deep breathing will calm the body down. And when the body calms down, the emotions calm down. And when the emotions calm down, the mind calms down. It's a very simple process. And you can do it doing Tai Chi. You can do it sitting down and meditating. You can do it anything. But mindfulness is the fact that you want to get past the thinking mind. And the thing that clouds the thinking mind is emotions and anxiety and anger and so on. So what you do to get around that is very, very simple. If you sit straight, breathe deep, and you just wait until you will... In the end, you will feel your mind will play endless tricks with you, but that's okay because, like I said, thoughts come and go. So you just let them in. You know, if you, if you, people often say to me, I, "I can't," you know, "I can't stop thinking," and I go, "That's okay," because when you start breathing deep and you just sit and wait, 
it has to calm down. There's no, there's nothing else for it to do. You can't hang on to a thought. They'll just, just let them come. They'll just keep coming. Let your anger come up. Let your emotions come. It doesn't matter because it'll all pass away. But what you've got to do is you've just simply got to wait it out. And the key to it is deep breathing. Good yeah. deep breathing. And, and when you breathe deep, your body calms down, your emotions will calm down, your mind calms down. And it's a little bit like the, the um, heart monitor, you know, where it goes beep, 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 beep. And then it goes beep, beep, beep. And when it flatlines and it goes beep, it means that you're not thinking anymore. And when you're not thinking, it's when you're in a mindful state. And that's where insight and wisdom will come up. That's when it will arise. So you'll become an insightful person and a wise person from that part of your brain, but you've got to access it. But it's one of those simple things that, um, and this Sanchin course that I'm doing in January for Paul Coleman, um, for his um, can cancer treatment, we're going to do Sanchin. And of course, Sanchin is three battles. And so therefore, it's the resolution of the battle of three. You know, so you've got to start with mind, body, and breath. You've got to harmonize them. And when you can harmonize mind, body, and breath, you know, then you can harmonize uh, your, your body, your breath, your emotions, and uh, then eventually you thought, so everything, those three battles are resolved to become one thing. Uh, and that is a mindful state. And my, my point with any martial art is, the learning process. Most people can't learn. You go into a seminar and watch people, and within seconds, their mind, the two enemies of the mind is laziness and distraction. And watch how those two enemies upset everybody, and no one has an attention span that goes more than 20 seconds or 30 seconds. So when you can prolong that, when you can be mindful and maintain your attention, you can learn so much more. So I start all my coaching programs here by training people how to learn. So we start with a little bit of mindfulness and meditation and deep breathing. So it's posture, breathing, learning, you know, how to stand properly, how to sit properly and so on. It's just simply so that people can learn, so that they can actually pay attention. But you watch them doing a Tai Chi form, within the time they've done 10 moves, you can tell their minds either wandered off somewhere or it's just gone dull. Yeah. So, the, the, sorry, rambling on a bit, but the, the qualities of the mind are awareness, focus, sensitivity, and intensity. And you must have all four. So, awareness like, is just actually being there, being aware and being present. But that's like a light. It can shine out everywhere. You need to focus it into like a torch beam. So, awareness and focus. When you can focus it, you need sensitivity, to you yourself, your own body, your own emotions, your own thoughts, and those of others and your environment as well. And finally, the guardian of it all is intensity. And that's the bit that most people miss because a lot of people do Tai Chi or meditation and they're off with the fairies. They're like, you know, uh, and it's actually, it's the opposite. It's like standing with your toes curling over the edge of a cliff and looking into the abyss. You've got to be really, really intense. Your arousal, actually, when you meditate, your level of arousal has got to be really high, but in a good way, not in a bad way. Yeah, you know what, Steve? Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I want to wrap it up for one reason, one reason only. To finish on that is just perfect. But the only thing I'm going to say is, you mentioned first of all, like earlier on, you were on about you know I didn't get any, I didn't get any qualifications at school, dude. You're one of the most insightful people I've ever met. Secondly, the other thing, as you were saying it, it was that funny because I'm like, wait a minute, Do I, I yeah, trust me. Even in your state at the moment, I wouldn't want to mess with you, Steve, because the simple reason you're turning around and saying, who would what who wants to who wants to learn from a guy with one leg in a wheelchair, mate. I'll tell you right now, anybody with half a brain listens mm. to the last thing that you just said, because as you're doing it, my brain is firing in every single direction. What problems do I have with kids? Two things, laziness straight away. And then they've got no attention span. And it's like <laughs> those two together, you're never going to get any work. And then it's like, again, nowadays we label it with everything where it's, I think we could get so much more from everybody from like, as you were saying, it's mindfulness isn't going homina, homina, homina. Mindfulness is knowing who you are 
at the right time all the time. Exactly. And, and, I, yeah. and that, that's a lifetime pursuit, man. But, mate, I'll tell you what. Some of the stuff you were saying, like I was making notes on my phone here because I'm like, <laughs> shit, I gotta look at this because at the moment with me, a lot of the mo- a lot of the stuff I'm doing at the moment is there's a couple of they're really hot. There's a guy called Huberman. I don't know if you've seen him. He's a neuroscientist. Mm. I'll send you a couple of links. So it's the physiology of the brain and working all the way down <laughs> into the limbic region, and that he's bringing it all with we're all within martial arts as well. Right. But it's but it's so fascinating because we know so it, you know the, the human brain's like the ocean, man. We, we, it's so much of it's uncharted, and oh, it, was yeah. like, yeah, it was like yeah, it is crazy. It was like when well, you were just saying there about the um, you know doing Sanchin, and you got three battles all at once, and I'm thinking when I was doing Sanchin Cat, all I was doing was tucking my balls up into my chest. And doing a lot of breathing, and I know that sounds, mm. yeah, but it, but it was the truth. That's how I was taught it, and it was like no, no. And then after a while, I remember going, "Oh man!" I, and it wasn't the fact that I was, you know, this is me personally. I was having to grip the floor, as you were saying it. This, this will freak you out. I was standing on the cliff, but unfortunately, it was in a, it was in a church hall in Hillfields in Coventry. But I was mm. gripping the floor, which you have to do in Sanchin Kata. I had to. As I said, pull my balls up, which I, I I just thought I was trying to work on my posture. But then afterwards, it's like, right, yeah. And then everything, because it was so slow, it was like I had to mm. understand it all. And it was like dynamic tension and everything. And it's like, believe it or not, it's one of the only cat That and Kushenko are the only two cats I still do. Kushenko, I do it because that pretty much has every single other Penang cat in there that I needed to learn. And it, well, it's funny how cat brings you back around, right? I'm going to teach the opposite in Sanchin. So there's a lot of um, Goju people on the course, but I'm going to teach the yin yang, the Chinese version of yin, yin, understanding the yin energy and the yang energy in the body, but also how internal energy, how qi or qi comes from being able to manipulate the spine, the core, and the vagus nerve. That's what Sanchin does. Right? Wow. So it, when you look at it, the first donut of cells in the human body. Is going to be the spine and the brain, and everything grows out from that. When you want real power out from your body, you must use spinal power. The spine doesn't have muscle. This obviously the core manipulates the spine, mm. and your whole neural system comes from the vagus nerve because that goes into every internal organ that you've got. So, um, and a lot of trauma and anxiety comes from vagal um, trouble or vagus. Um, problems so I, i'm going to teach a version of sanchin that would seem so alien to you but what i'm going to say to these people is it's just the inside of what you're doing you've got the inside and the outside so you can do exactly what you do just use this understand i'll show you how to release your joints not tighten them i'll show you how to release the tissue don't tighten it because it it needs to be functional and wow. the spine and the core are the things that will give you energy and power. If you want energy out of your hands and your legs, it's got to come from the spine and the core. If it comes from your shoulders or your arms, or it's cheap power. It's what the Chinese call lick. It's like ringing a little bell. Ding, yong, geng. Geng is like thunder, you know? Uh, so you man, dig- you, 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 you're blowing my, mind, blowing my mind, Steve, with this. I'm telling you. Uh, uh, but and you really think, could- your toes shouldn't be gripping the floor. You know, because the arches of your feet are the first pumps of chi. You've got four pumps of chi in the body, and the arches of the feet are the first pumps. So when you spiral in your feet, and when you bow the bows of your body, which is the legs, the spine, and the arms, the connected bows, and when you bow them, the arches of your feet will flatten and then come up again. That pump is what pumps the energy around the body. So if you are curling your toes, you're too far forwards in your feet. Thing is, I, w- I wouldn't knock what other people do. All I'm doing is no. say, I'll, g- I'll give you the inside. I'll give yeah, you the oh, bit that you haven't got. Hey, Steve, you know what I mean? It's been a pleasure. What we will do is we'll wrap up on this. So I want you, always should let the gentleman have the, the, the final last word, right? And all I'll do is, out of all the years of martial arts that you're doing, I know it's going to be a hard one to answer, right? There's one piece of advice you would give anybody when it comes to martial arts, what would it be? Yeah. And, and this is applied to absolutely everything, right? It's a soft front and a strong back. 
So you always be polite, gentle, careful, soft, always receive even an opponent with softness, but you've got to have the back, you've got to have the spine, you've got to have the power to back it up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's not martial arts. That's life in general, man. Oh, man. Who Soft front, thought, strong back. Hey, Steve, who would have thought wearing those pajamas years ago would get us to where we are today, mate? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> unreal. True. But hey, I, honestly, I, I, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Great to see you. Great to see you in such good form. And, uh, you know, mate, yeah, who wouldn't want to learn from you? And I, and I do mean that. That's it, it's like you, it's like you've, you, you said earlier. But thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. You're welcome, sir.